Sure. Because then there's an incentive for people to bust their butts, make investment, take risks, and you can come out a billionaire. If you want right. To be that busy. Otherwise, you just come out, everybody's the same, and, and your level of effort just goes down, down, down. Sure. And that is social. Sure. That's why it doesn't work. That's a, that's a really good explanation, yeah. And, uh, and it's never succeeded. And that difference between equality and equity. Really, something people need to understand. Sure. Yeah. You know, that's a, I was up in Spokane. We busted our bus. Oh, yeah. And installing some doors. So it's building. Mm -hmm. Oh, they built these doors. The door frames were really soft. We were put together in such a Mickey Mouse way. We were putting it they were in one time. And uh, the corner came from the area is falling off. You know? The air turned a little. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go to confession after that. Right. <laughs> That's funny. Monday is his day off, so that's the time when I can get up. He gets Sunday to Monday off. Uh, and that's when I can get up there and help him out. I almost tried to come to class and make it until oh. to pick off a 10, then I wouldn't be getting there until noon. It's a good thing I did. And I would enjoy the things to class. Good. It just, <laughs> we wouldn't have gotten too much fun. <laughs> I mean, it took us all day long when that first door was installed. And is, second, this, is this just like a regular house door or is this like a garage door? Like, no, it's a roller. It's a regular. No, we installed it. Uh -huh. That didn't go too bad. We had two of those in one day a couple of weeks ago. Uh -huh. Because we had a problem. We had a really good job in the corner. Uh -huh. and, uh, so that was a little tricky too. These are like the regular front door of the house. The, the door itself has a steel veneer around it. Okay, yeah. Insulation in the middle, but it's a soft wood piece of junk. And you know, you could just walk up to that door and just kick it in and walk right in. Wow. Big house. Hey. Hello. So what's the brand? So Welcome. We can, who made the door? So we know how to do it. Weird thing. It's, uh, and, but, but <laughs> Home Depot. Uh, What's better, Home Depot or Lowe's? I don't know. Boy, I don't know. Like yeah, sorry. whatever's closer. <laughs> yeah. Right. My son likes to lower at Home Depot or at uh, Lowe's. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, PBS is sweet. I like PBS. I like the building supply a lot. All right, guys. Um, welcome. Um, that actually be cool sometime in the future to get our show. Now it's sponsored by Amish butter spoon whipped maple syrup, but it'd be cool to get it sponsored by Moscow or Pullman Building Supply in the future. I'll talk to them. My wife is a is a you know multiple prolific repeat customer at Pullman Building Supply. They know her by on a first name basis. Today's lecture is Renaissance, Pascal, and Descartes. Let's talk about, I'm going to give you a nice long timeline really quick. And especially, it's just the three of us today. We can be kind of really efficient. Um, and I, 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 will, I will admit that I'm really looking forward to some of the later lectures coming up down the road with Blue Collar Apologetics, Chesterton, that kind of thing. Um, hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning. So timeline from 1517 to 1789. 
1517, Martin Luther begins the Protestant Reformation, of course. 1517, Luther nails his 95 theses to the Wittenberg Cathedral door. 1533, the guy who had won an award from the Pope for his defense of the seven sacraments, Henry VIII, establishes the Anglican Church. And 1536, John Calvin. Calvinism, what, you know, segues later into him in America with the Puritans first in Massachusetts Bay Colony, but later Presbyterianism. But very, very quickly, 1517 Luther, 1533 Henry VIII, um, 1536 John Calvin, you have what I would say, and of course I say this with chauvinism, and chauvinism, remember, the, the colloquial definition of chauvinism often is collegated to male chauvinism, but chauvinism just means extreme patriotism. So a male chauvinist is someone who, you know, just is all about men, men are the best, that's why it's often, but Chauvinism just means, again, extreme patriotism. If you're a person who thinks America can never, ever, ever do wrong, no matter what, you're a chauvinist. I'm a Catholic chauvinist. Yeah, like I, I'm convinced Catholicism is the truth. And so, okay, um, take that with a grain of salt. Declare your biases. But I mean, I think absolutely this Protestant stuff is a huge assault on logic. A huge assault on logic. This class is about logic, Right. This class is about building a logical train. We have our patron saint, the dumb ox of logic. And these Protestant guys break this apart. Now, let's start in order. Like Luther, let's talk about what's not logical about these people. But before we do, Luther, to have sympathy towards him, I get it, right? Like there was a lot of corruption in the church. There always is. Is there not corruption now among some people in the church? Of course there is. The bride of Christ, she is spotless and perfect. And against her, the gates of hell will not prevail. But the men are scumbags often. People are horrible, right? So Luther, fine. And as Betsy Johnson, our friend, said, of the 95 theses, around half the Catholic Church says, you know, you had a good point. He's an Augustinian priest. And you had a point in saying this should be reformed, but he should do it from within. What is illogical about Martin Luther? His sola scriptura thing. That never, nowhere in the Bible does it say that the Bible alone. It does not say that. Protestants will cite something, I think it's from the fifth chapter of St. John's Gospel, search, search the scriptures, and in them you'll find wisdom. I agree. The Holy Scriptures are the infallible word of God. Nowhere does it say this is your only rule of faith. In fact, Protestants act like the Bible fell bound from heaven, like an angel threw it down. Here you go, guys. And of course, it's not. The Bible arises out of capital T, church tradition. When Christ criticized the Pharisees for keeping traditions, korban, it was this idea of like, oh, I'm going to say that the money that, I, that I'm supposed to give to my parents in Jewish tradition, my, my aging parents, I'm going to dedicate that to God. But I'm not really. I'm going to use it for like a yacht or something or my own personal. So I'm lying to God. I'm, I'm committing a sin. I'm committing, you know, I'm manipulating this tradition. Capital T, sacred tradition, the Catholic Church is part of that De Verbum, that word of God. And out of that magisterial tradition, right, arises the canon of scripture. Tell, where in the Bible does it show you what, what books are supposed to be in the Bible? Does it? Right. It, yeah, right. The church determines that because Christ founded a church, right? So that's so illogical, number one, the sola scriptura thing. Sola fide. The only place it, say, it says um, being saved by, by faith alone in the Bible is that you're not. In James's letter, James, uh, his, his letter, his second chapter, when he's like, what good is it to say to a, uh, you know, um, what good is it to say to a brother you see, like, you know, on the street or whatever, keep warm. I hope you find the necessities of life. You don't give it to him. Faith without works is dead. So the only time faith and works are talked about in the Bible is that you're not supposed to be about faith alone. So, if so Lutheranism and Protestantism as it begins is 100% wholly illogical, wholly detached from the tradition of the church. And by the tradition of the church, I mean that which all binds us together. That beautiful prayer Christ addresses to the Heavenly Father, John 17, 21. That, that 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 for unity that, that, that as you and I are one they will be one i hope all christians are one god bless all christians god bless all people and praise christ i'm talking about the tradition that he betrays of all of us this is not again a chauvinistic catholic versus protestant thing this is listen man for forever to be a christian was to hold to the tradition those first early centuries when you have on the one hand those beautiful martyrs their blood you know seeding the church and you have, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these councils and these 
the, the popes at that time and the Episcop episcopacy and the, the successors of the apostles determining what doctrine, determining what is going to be in the scripture, not till the late fourth century, Council of Carthage, I think is in 397, you have a canon of scripture. So you can't, you need the church to talk about what's in the Bible. Henry VIII, what's more illogical than I just want to hook up with Anne Boleyn? That, that's why he leaves, uh, you know, that's why he leaves the Catholic Church. He won an award from the Pope in 1521 for a very logical, logic class, a logical defense of the seven sacraments, Aquinas style. And then he decides, I want to follow my libido. Okay, so we have, hello, Father. So we have two, two epic fail Protestant beginnings in Lutheranism, sola fide, sola scriptura, which are not scriptural, not Bible-based at all. There is nothing stupider than, oh, Catholicism isn't based on the Bible. It is the Bible. Scott Hahn, famously um, the, the convert from Calvinism, well, which we'll talk about next. Scott Hahn says that was his great conversion moment when he was at a Catholic mass and realized it's the book of Revelation. This is the most biblical faith. So Luther claiming, you know, sola fide, sola scriptura, claiming uh, to follow the Bible from princ principles that are inherently non-biblical. And in fact, Luther scandalously suggests, why don't we just remove the book of James? You know, that pesky thing. So much for the warning and revelation at the end. Don't remove a single word of this, right? Whoever adds or subtracts this will be, you know, punished. And then Henry VIII, there's not even any kind of attempt at any kind of um, philosophical I want to think of a different word than even logic, just philosophical astuteness, flexibility. There's not even like an appeal to theology. It's, I want to hook up with Anne Boleyn. The Pope is bad. The Pope is a bad guy because he will not grant me a divorce from Catherine of Aragon. So, okay, that's the founding of Anglicanism. And then what, is, what do the Anglicans do? They steal all the church property in England. Sorry, British people. All, for all of that land in England that was developed, that was um, you know plowed and tilled and stuff, thousand years of wealth stored up, were the monks, where St. Augustine of Canterbury was the Catholic Church. And when Henry VIII is like, yeah, I'd like to hook up with Anne Boleyn, he's like, well, I do that. Why don't you guys take the church property? It will nationalize it. Well, that, there's, your start of, there, there's your start of Anglicanism there. A thousand years of Catholic work on the British Isles stolen overnight by Henry the Pirate. And Calvin, great, man, predestination. You know, again, we talked about this with Augustine. We said, God is like a man standing on a mountain who sees two trains about to crash, Okay, imagine you're, you're just a man, in this, you're just a person in this example. Just because you have foreknowledge, these trains are going to crash, does not mean you cause it, right? You, you can have foreknowledge of something without causing it. God, because of his omnipotence and his omniscience, uh, but with his all-powerful, you know, all all-encompassing wisdom and power, he knows what we're going to do. And as Boethius said, God does not have a past, present, or future. He's eternally now. He knows what we're going to do but he allows us to still do it. He just knows the choices you're going to make with your free will, but he's not puppet mastering you. And yet Calvinism rests. You have the five principles, tulip, but really on that kind of idea of both total depravity and predestination, that, that we have been completely wounded by the fall, completely destroyed. Our reason is completely useless. Calvinism is the most anti-Aquinas thing going because Aquinas says, right, grace does not destroy nature. It builds upon nature. Even our fallen nature we go to confession, we repent, God builds on that matter. Or the Calvinists say, no, it's been completely destroyed. And by the way, no matter what you do, before you even enter this class, I already assigned you an A or an F. Protestantism, class over, 100% illogical. It's illogical. You have the illogical stuff of claiming biblical authority for things that are not biblical, or the Bible contradicts, epic fail. Or we're going to leave the, the faith we know is the truth, Catholicism, Anglicans are very close to us because they're like, yeah, like we love the trappings of the faith and the mass and, you know, even in son and, and, and incense, but we're going to leave that because we want to have sex with, with people that aren't our wives. That's pretty logical, pretty, pretty contradictory to, to, to biblical revelation, 10 commandments. And finally, Calvinism. Yeah. You know, God is good though, but he made some people just to burn in hell. That's 100% illogical and um, flies directly in the face of so much of what we've been building in this class talking about with Aquinas. There's a reason why Protestants really hate Aquinas. A lot of people get really triggered talking about like snowflake culture wars whenever Protestants get into Aquinas. Because again, I'm saying this once more as a Catholic chauvinist, I'm admitting my, my um, prejudice. I'm admitting I'm a Catholic. I'm not a neutral party here. I'm not here talking about the difference between Shia and Sunni Islam. I'm not, I'm not Muslim. If I was talking about 
uh, the Shiite versus the Sunni uh, denominations of Islam, I could be neutral. I, I'm not part of either faith. I'm not neutral here. I'm a devout Catholic. So, you know, middle finger to me, if you want to do that and say, you're just a biased guy, fine. We have our biases. I promise to come, come to you one second. Um, I will not forget your point. But so what, what I'm saying here is there's a reason that why Protestants are so angry. And there's been this kind of like Aquinas um, renaissance among some Protestants, uh, uh, Protestants reading Aquinas is because Aquinas often exposes the whole house of cards of the illogical nature of most Protestant denominations. Protestant denominations are just based on, oh, I just stayed the Bible. Where did the Bible come from? I don't know. Do you believe the Bible fell from heaven bound? Because you're acting like God dropped the Bible on your head completely. Well, no, of course not. Okay. Oh, but you're infallible, right? Of course I'm not infallible. Well, you're not infallible. You said no man is infallible. Why is your interpretation true? Uh, right? So just anytime you get into like Aquinas principles, you find just the illogical nature of stepping outside of the church. Sorry, sorry. You know, maybe I should put a trigger warning on this video. Um, Trish, Trish Schmidt, yes. Oh, well, I was just going to say, recently I learned um, to help me understand the difference between Calvinism, well, in the Catholic churches, Calvinism is double predestination. And maybe you already said that. What is double predestination? Well, predestination means God knows where you will, you know, end up. Whereas double predestination means that you are determined, even you are created. Too. Yeah, that's so yeah. stupid. That's double dumb. That's double moron. That's double full well, moron. There is, it is. It probably is. It means that in your perspective, but I think the main reason it is double dumb is because that presumes that God created something for the purpose of. No, you're exact, No, yeah, no. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's seriously, it's despicable. It's disgusting. Yeah. And I, 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 I'm not going to pull any punches on this or even make jokes. It's disgusting and satanic, even. And like, I, I will say hundred percent, I mean, no, it really it is satanic. Like the, the nature of the demons and the devil is to destroy, is to kill, is to be evil. And you, when you say that, if you actually believe that, and this is why, again, God bless Aquinas. Look how great we have Aquinas. Aquinas asks us to take everything to a logical conclusion. Your logic better be that an egg is an egg. If, if it's not adding up, if you're saying an egg is a dog, you're wrong. So we got to take this end of the conclusion. Dave Schmidt hit it right on the head. <laughs> If you're saying this double predestination that God actually made someone, made an innocent, precious baby for the purpose of burning in the fires of hell, God is evil. God is evil. God is not good. Only the Catholic, only the Catholic uh, position, which is, I'm sorry to, you know, breaking news, the Christian position, the only fully Christian position is that God loves us so much that God will not force us to be with him. He has made all men for salvation. In fact, you freaking Protestants, Timothy 2 somewhere, Timothy 2.14, God has willed that all men are saved. It says in the Bible, what you claim is your full, your only rule. I'm going to find this right now. And then Brad King, I saw you had your hand up. I'd say this predestination thing doesn't square very well with what they say about us having free will. Okay. You guys remind me of um, predestination. That um, tends to a better picture, um, take for instance, an orange tree, for instance, and predestination to the things of the um, predestination, but when we look at predestination as uh, maybe um, being already convinced to. An eternal damnation, then it's a wrong perspective of what predestination is all about. But in nature, if there are elements of predestination, we are, we are destined to be humans and not other animals. And that's why in nature it's difficult to see a man generate any other thing other than a fellow human. See, so maybe from that perspective, we could look at the destination, but the other spiritual aspect of it, the free will of man, is what we do with the destination of man, this primary is to return to God to spend it. Yes, and so that was a beautiful explanation. That's true, and that's exactly why, like you know, quibbling over terms and whatever. Of course, like what, what the Calvinists are all about is the sovereignty of God. 
They never shut up about that. And like, and thank God, praise God. God is sovereign King and Lord, 100%. What they don't understand is God cannot choose to do evil. God, you can God make a rock so heavy that he could not pick it up? Yes. He, he is all powerful. He, he, can, he can limit himself if he wants. God limited himself to die on the cross, to become in. God, is, God can only, by the very nature of his ontological being, I am who I am, him being goodness, he cannot do evil. And the catechism talks about this. And this is why, again, this sucks. Sorry for the vulgar term, but it does. It sucks that Catholics are the only ones that really seem to have a kind of a catechism of doctrine that helps elucidate with magisterial blessing, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, biblical truth. Talking about, oh, you say God is all-powerful. Well, God can't die or do evil, so he's not all-powerful. And the catechism says those are defects of power. If God could do evil, that wouldn't be, oh, look, he can do whatever he wants. It would be a defect. He is so perfect. He cannot do evil. So if God, as Dave Schmidt said again, if God has created someone just to burn in hell, he is evil. And he is not evil. Therefore, that is false. You have a lot. This, look how great this class is for logic. You have A or B. This is not a false dichotomy. This is a, a true dichotomy. If God made someone for the purpose of just burning the fires of hell, he is evil. And if he's not evil, and we know he's not evil, we believe that in faith and by, by reason, by all things, then that can't be the case. It can't be both. So which one is it? Is it that God is evil or the Calvinists are right? What, what, you know, the, the God is evil and the Calvinists are right or the Calvinists happen to be wrong? It's A or B. I think the answer is pretty obvious. And in fact, I would say to any Calvinist Bible Christian, right? Again, guys, right? I just said the Bible didn't fall down from heaven. It is in the infallible word of God. I hate modernism, postmodernism. Maybe that's what, the reason I like it so much in my life. Like as a writer, like I hate postmodern inventiveness in the faith. I am like old school, old school, like traditional Catholic in, in a lot of ways. So the Bible is the inspired word of God. I do not believe any of this nonsense. Well, it depends, blah, 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 blah. There's no errors in the Bible. The Bible is the infallible word of God. I am 100% with the Protestants there. But that's that's their only rule of faith. We say de verbum, right? Which I'm about to talk now about the Council of Trent is the word of God and the magisterium is the church, Catholic tradition. You guys only take the Bible. So Protestants, how do you explain 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to knowledge of truth, period. Infallible sacred scripture, common sense, it can't be contradicted. Scripture can't be set aside. This is going full moron, this double predestination stuff. It says in the only rule of faith that you have, which we agree is the infallible word of God, that God desires all men to be saved. So God desires all men to be saved, but he made some men to burn in hell. Well, then I guess he doesn't desire all men. Then I guess the Bible's wrong. Then I guess you have to become an atheist or something else or a Hindu or new age because the Bible's false. Because your, your whole system is based upon the infallible word of God, but I guess the Bible lies to you, right? Oh no, I guess maybe it's not the Bible lies and God isn't evil. You're a moron. Your system sucks. Maybe that's what it is. And sorry, I'm I am getting worked up. I really hate hate that that that's the worst heresy I think of all time. I so much prefer the kind of la 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 the la, la Protestant, you know, walk down everyone is saved. I way more prefer that. I way more because at least there is like acknowledgement of God's goodness. It's like, look, the the Catechism says, do not fall into um, despair or presumption. Do not uh, Calvinism is one hundred percent despair. No, that's one hundred percent despair. I don't know if I'm saved or not. I have no idea. And the fact is, if I'm, if I'm a Calvinist and I'm like, oh, I know I'm saved, I'm just a liar because I just said God is sovereign and, I, and you know, he's predestined to us. I don't know. And, but, but I know I'm saved. That's just so arrogant and stupid. It's just so stupid all the way around. Calvinism is, is a despair and like kind of Bible Christian uh, altar call latte church is like presumption. Oh, I, I just I've, I've accepted Christ, my Lord and Savior. And therefore, I know I'm saved. Catholic position is to Timothy. Or, or, or Philippians 2, Philipp, Philippians 2, 2, 12, uh, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. You don't know. Timothy 1, 2, 3, 4, God has uh, desires you to be saved, but you don't know. You got to work it out. You got to fight every single day. Don't fall into presumption or despair. Don't assume you're saved or assume you're damned. Know that God definitely died for your sins. He wants you to be saved, but you have to cooperate with his grace, right? And that's the most, that, that, that to me, again, talk about logic is so logical. It's so logical. Go ahead. You had a, a, a question. You think is the I mean you know, knows the percentage of Calvinistic Protestants to I don't know. 
I mean, again, and I'll, I'll, I want to say, I want to say this for the record now, if, again, if these videos ever become watched by people right now, it's just us. Like, I, I mean this sincerely. I'm not trying to be woke or politically correct. I do respect all people's faith. I really do. And even specifically in the Calvinistic community, I respect a lot of their traditionalism and like seriousness. I do. So I want to just state that for the record. What, as I get back to like an insult train. I don't know because it's Protestantism because they have no respect for authority. They just do whatever they want, right? I mean, that, that, that is what it is. Like if I'm sitting here, right? If I were to walk over to any Protestant community in Moscow and say, my interpretation of the Bible is X, no one can tell me I'm wrong. They can't tell me I'm wrong because if they say, oh, actually I'm right. Why are you right? Because you went to like Grove Theological Seminary, something like that. Great, dude. So, okay. So, so you sound like a papist now. You sound like some of this, you know, this papist, uh stupid catholics who claim infallibility are you are you a pope and the guy would have to say yeah I'm, I, have, I have infallibility but they denied that so if any protestant minister is like me we're all equal protestantism is the ultimate like woke they talk about equity and stuff it's like anyone can just pick up their bible everyone's a priest kind of stuff and it's like so it could be i don't i, I can't answer your question presbyterians or calvinists um i can talk you I can you know talk your ear off i won't for the sake of time about all the denominations that, that are come from calvinism what i'm saying is What's stopping someone from like who's la 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 church, like Joel Osteen, the prosperity gospel, from just saying, oh, I believe in that, by the way. They just they pick whatever they want. Uh, here, l- let me criticize us now. Catholics do this today, which really sucks. You know, 99% of Catholics use contraception. And just like, I don't care what the Pope says, right? Cafeteria Catholicism. Cafeteria Catholicism is just Protestant Catholicism, right? Just, I'm not, I, I, well, not going to listen to church on this, whatever. So it's like, and again, I mean this on bended knee. I'm the worst. I'm the worst triple middle finger to me i'm the worst i'm, I'm not like oh I'm, I'm better than these people at, at all i'm just saying that what's so great about this class and these paradigms is showing like aquinas logically lays out just simply that egg is an egg this is what the church has always taught and these guys come along and perhaps with good intentions luther had good intentions he wanted to reform the church and she needed to be reformed some ways but then he goes and starts doing unbiblical stuff and claiming biblical authority for it that's epic fail it's, it's illogical it's a huge logical fallacy. And then John Calvin goes psycho nuts with predestination, double predestination, all quadruple predestination. It's just like, what are you talking about? It just, it's so divorced from the reality of the tradition. It's so, it's like, no one, I don't understand how Protestants claim Augustine is one of their own. They do. And it's like, he's so, he's, he has treatises upon treatises about the real presence of the Eucharist, church authority, everything. And it's like, oh, because he, he, talked about Father Ben predestination, which is the correct term that indeed, amen, as Father Ben so eloquently said, that God, of course, is predestined like people to breathe with their lungs and et cetera. But God's ultimate predestination is 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4, for God desires all men to be saved. That's predestination. God has predestined every single one of us to go to heaven. He wants every single one of us to be in heaven, but we have to, to Philippians 12, work out our salvation fear and trembling, right? We have to work for it every single day. We have to receive the sacraments, go to confession, ask for forgiveness, do not presume or despair. That's the only logical position. And the Council of Trent reaffirms this. 1545 to 1563, the Council of Trent, right now, Xander, I was on a long, long rant about Protestants. I'm glad you weren't here because you're not a Protestant, but you're from Arkansas, so you might be approximately offended. Uh, 1545, 1563, three, the Council of Trent reaffirms that truth is via scripture and tradition. Okay. The day of Arabum, this one deposit of faith and the council of Trent does a lot of cleaning up, a lot of cleaning up of stuff um, in the church. The council of Trent completes Luther's. Maybe I started the race first two steps. Good. And then I fell in a ditch proper reform. And that's why so we talk about the Tridentine mass, right. And having that, that, that missile all the way up to ni- the 1962 missile or something, some of the FSSP, um, uh, communities use this trinity mass that that holds sway this three session council of trent which is from again 1545 to 63 a direct pushback against just three examples that i gave you and we want to talk about a logic final burn on the protestants sorry protestants luther does his thing and what happens immediately after luther does his thing the anabaptist revolt these peasants rise up and they're like oh so there's no authority there's no pope every man is his own priest i'm a priest now and luther's like no you stupid peasant you're not okay, dude. And they just go nuts. And then they have 30,000 denominations. And guess what? The Anabaptists are right. Either we have one church against which the gates of hell will not prevail. And there's a Pope 
And I hate the Pope and I love the Pope. However, I feel about the Pope, he's my dad, my biological father, the vicar of Christ. Either that's true or everyone's a Pope, right? Or there's no Pope, everyone's authority. Trish Schmidt, let's found let's make our own church, right? Why not? What Protestant can tell us we can't make our own church? On what authority? On what authority? You guys made your own church. You guys made your own seminary. We can do whatever. I can make my own church like out in, in, in the field somewhere, right? It's, it's a complete joke. Protestantism is a joke. Well, uh, didn't they base that on wherever two or more are gathered together? Thing. Yeah, sure. But again, it's like, here's the here's the non-troll, non-anger, non-polemical, just kind of honest answer. I need you all to read G.K. Chesterton, The Catholic Church and Conversion. And he says, and this is the, the I, to me, like a final word on this. Every Protestant denomination has truth in it. Of course it does. And that's why I said I respect Protestants. In fact, um, Anyone who's baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is a member of that one Christian church, the one universal Catholic church. Protestant marriages are valid. Praise God. Uh, a, a Protestant friend, a kind of hypothetical, you know, random person who every day gets up and reads the Bible. What a holy good person. I pray they complete their faith. I have full respect for them. What Chesterton says in that book is Protestants, Protestantism always is taking one part of integral faith and building a thing around it. God is sovereign like the Calvinists say. But don't make an idol out of his sovereignty to where some people are made for, for um, hell. Um, the Bible is awesome. Don't make an idol out of the Bible. The Bible is all you need. Even the Bible says it's not all you need. Or it doesn't say anywhere that it's all you need. So Protestants have truth all throughout. Of course they do. But what they refuse to do is instead of taking the whole 100% picture, they take bits and pieces out of it and then build a whole system around it. Well, the Bible says wherever truth you gather in your name, it, therefore that's my church. Well, what does that passage actually say common sense? It's talking about prayer. It's saying if you and I are gathered, if you and I get together and we say, Lord, we ask you, Father, in Jesus' name for this intention, praise God. Christ has promised, especially hear us praying in his name where two three gather. It doesn't mean it's a church. And in fact, he says in Matthew 16, upon you, I will build my church. Mm -hmm. So the, nothing about that is a church. If Trish Schmidt and I are out in the field praying in Christ's name, we're doing a great thing. But why is that? If, that's not ecclesiology, mm -hmm. right? So it's like the... Protestantism is always a declension and a removal, kind of like a surgical procedure of taking out of the whole thing of truth one or two aspects and saying, well, this is the whole deal now. Uh, you know, I mean, Joel Osteen. I actually like Joel Osteen in some ways. Like, I, I, I probably because people hate him so much. And like, he's so swarmy. It's like, you know, Joel Osteen is taking one part of Christian truth, of joy, and just maybe, again, I, I do not want to bear false witness. I do not want to commit sins, especially in Lent. And be like, he's made an idol. I don't, I don't, how dare I judge him? I'm not trying to judge him. But he does. If you've ever seen Joe Austin kind of speeches, all about just joy, happiness, prosperity. He's not wrong. Like, it's supposed to be rapturous joy in heaven. It's just like, okay, is he doing the Protestant thing of just this one focus, not focusing on the other aspects of it? I don't know. Anyways, again, I really, maybe let's end this, this Protestant rant with, again, a more denunciation of me. You know, before I remove... You know, Matthew chapter seven, before I remove the um, splinter from my brother's eye, remove my own beam. To any Protestants watching later, no, you guys still suck. I was going to apologize. You guys suck. Yeah. I, Go ahead. I appreciate your energy and your intelligence and all of that. Seriously. Um, but maybe especially during Lent. It is important to remember we are, in fact, all God's creatures. Amen. No, and I, and, uh, and I think if you did, I, I, I understand. I, I appreciate what you said about um, the individual versus the church. Um, but I think it's also important not to let the church have a shadow. Amen. Amen. No, look, there is people. There's someone on Twitter yesterday. Who is denouncing Catholicism? Some woman, she was like, you know, Catholic Church is everything, all the kind of terrible things. But I love Catholics. I believe her. I believe her. And there is an old grandma saying, which I subscribe to, you know, don't dish it out if you can't take it. Someone tells me, you know, Catholicism is false, but I, I, I love Catholics, but I just hate the Catholic Church. Okay, I, I believe you. I believe that you're honestly convinced that Catholicism is false. I will second that, not out of simple correctness. I, I want to have sympathy for all people. Look at someone even like Christians. Oh my gosh. Like I told you, like I went to a, a Protestant wedding in December. It was beautiful. It was awesome. Uh, yeah. I wish they had a master. It was awesome. The pastor had a nice, you know, sermon and the couple loves Christ. Thank God. No, that's, that's, that is not a question. 
Um, I think our society has become so soft swirled. It's like that e even me getting, I'm getting a little bit worked up. That's nothing. You guys should go read some stuff like St. Alphonsus Liguori and some of these like polemics from the Middle Ages. It's so insanely based and just like vicious. Um, Ignatius of Loyola, and I'm kind of censoring here now, was like, was walking down the street and someone insulted Our Lady and he like wanted to, he's like made a private intention. If this guy turns left, I'm going to go fight him or something. I'm, I'm dead serious. Like he was going to go fight this guy, like, like did a duel with a knife or something. He's like, you know, and he's like, I, I, I sound so stupid and superstitious. This is a true story. Like nation's walking. He's like, God, I'll take it as a sign. If it, he, this guy would like said some blasphemous thing about Our Lady. And of course, any Protestants no, we don't worship Mary blasphemous because she's, you know, the sacred new Ark of the Covenant. Blasphemous in his proximity to she is vessel of our Lord. And he's like, if if this guy, Lord, we're walking the street, if this guy turns left, I'll take his assignment. You want me to go fight this guy to defend her honor? I mean, this is like, I'm not proposing fighting Protestants or anything. I, I, like, I'm, I'm, my, my, I'm not even raising to a two out of 10 venom level. Dave, you're right. And I would actually add to you or in contradiction to you, not just during Lent, always. I, I swear, I swear, and, and, you know, may God help me. I have no problem whatsoever with, with any Protestants or, or like, I, I, I don't have a right to. We're all sinners. What I'm saying is I'm so sick and tired of this like post-Vatican II new rant, uh, just like over the top ecumenism. Like we're all blah, blah, blah. Just shut up. Let's let's argue more. Like we're, we're obviously, we don't believe the same stuff. We don't, we really don't, you know? And I feel like often the, Cat the Protestants have no problem telling us that, you know, you guys have a false church. Great. Hold my beer. Strap your seatbelt in. Let's go. I'm serious. What is up with this kind of like la, 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 la? That's, I just, I, I don't know. So I just, I want to agree with you wholeheartedly that there is no question um, on an individual level, the people, the highest respect. Um, I was on some Protestant website yesterday, um, the Moscow church. And the, there's the, the picture of the, there's the picture of the pastor and he's wearing like a t-shirt and he's smiling. I thought like, what a lovely guy. I bet he's a really good guy. Great family man. Like no problem. I'm talking about like in the roots of this doctrine, it's like we've become so soft world over of like, there's no real difference. You know, it's like, no, there's huge differences. Why are there differences? And I, I don't think if, if we're ever serious about the goal of ecumenism, which is always being united in the truth, how do we get there if we're just like, oh, it's great. It's awesome. You know, my, my, my brother was an atheist. And now this is not a true story. It's hypothetical. But like, you know, my brother, my cousin was an atheist. Now he goes to some Bible church where they just preach heresy, but it's great. I mean, he's in church. Like that's our attitude. I don't know. Tell me, attack me again. I, I want to be attacked again. Tell me why I'm wrong. Go. Well, I'm not going to say where you, but I just want to comment that um, I think for all of us, including me, there's a temptation to make things your idol. And I'm kind of, I mean, um, I kind of am drawn toward the more traditional faith with traditional Latin mass and stuff, a kind of feeling. But even there, you can make the mass your idol versus God. Agreed. You know? Agreed. So I don't know. I think a person always needs to to think to rethink their life and kind of refocus for God. I mean, you can make anything your idol, even something holy and biased and I I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I wish with every fiber of my being that the, the Pope ordered everyone go back to Latin Mass. I absolutely I wish, and it would have to be the next Pope, I guess, or two Pope, whatever. It's not going to be the Holy Father um, Francis, obviously. But like, I wish we were ordered to go back to Latin Mass. All of you Catholic morons have a, a year to get this cleaned up. One year we're starting Latin Mass. So I believe that. I've attended maybe three Latin masses in my life, like in, in agreement with you. Like, I'm not like, oh, I'm not going to, if I'm like, I'm not going to attend the Novus Ordo, that's a sin because the church has said, no, the, you know, the, the Novus Ordo and Vatican II is legit. So I, I have to accept that. And I do, right. It would be sinful and wrong for me to be like, I'm never going to attend a Novus Ordo mass. You know, if I can't get to a Latin mass, I'm just going to, you know, not go to mass because the mat that, that Latin mass is my idol. You're right. You can do that. I have a deep, deep devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. You cannot make her an idol. There's a thing about like in Mexico and Poland where there's this uh, deep devotion to the Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. um, the Poles have a deep devotion to Our Lady of Transtahova, like Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. And in Poland, there's a thing that Poles first love Our Lady of Transtahova, then the Pope, then Jesus. And it's meant to be like a joke. That's heretical and blasphemous if that was true. Oh, our Polish Pope and our... No, no. So you can make anything an idol. I agree. Like I said, I believe Protestants make the Bible an idol even sometimes. 
you know, I refuse to, I refuse to look at the history of the church and the church fathers and the develop, you know, the magisterial tradition. I'm just going to say, I don't care that, that there is no canonized scripture until 400 years after Christ's death and resurrection. Um, I'm, that's my thing, the Bible only, right? Couldn't agree with you more. My whole point of my rant today, actually, it feels good to do a rant. I don't have to, I don't have to do like just full on rants. But my whole thing here is number one, I am the worst. I'm serious. Like I am not better than any single person. I'm that will never put myself on a pedestal. Number two, agree with Dave. We should have nothing but charity. St. Paul says, you know, without charity, I'm just like a resounding gong. Don't make anything an idol. But if all those things are in place, I'm just having a clarion call for I like Bishop Barron. God bless him. Can I criticize Bishop Barron? I think he's somebody's too like, let's dialogue. How about like punch people with the truth? Like, why not? Why not? Why like I, I I guess I say you, you always dislike the things that you do. Does that make sense? I think like we dislike in others uh, the things that we ourselves do. I, I think I'm too nice. I really do. I, I really do. I'm, I'm too much like, oh, there's, you know, let's look at the positive side. Maybe because I'm not a person who like is radically honest. I want to see more of that. Maybe I see in Bishop Barron too much of myself of like, just let's find the common ground. It's like, how about no? How about start dropping atomic bombs and like, just like, boom, you know, like Father Crappy, uh, maybe I love him so much because he was so much not like me. Father Crappy would often say like, here's an in your face statement. Protestants are wrong or something like that. Just awesome. It's awesome. And it seems like all Catholic media today is just like, everyone's great. Everyone just, I don't like that. I don't like that. Is that okay? Can I not like that? Who wants to tell me I, I'm not allowed to like that? Yeah. Um, just wondering, what uh, is the draw of the Latin Mass? We probably didn't grow up with the Latin Mass as the norm. Like mm -hmm. the yes. No, of course not. Right. I was born in 1987, so it's been. Yeah, I grew up with it. Yeah. So I'm curious to know. Yeah. Excellent question. Thank you. Um, everything. Um, but how do I answer this? Like in point by point specific specificness. Latin is a dead language in a good way. Therefore, it's not going to be open to liturgical abuse, number one. Um, you know, I'm not saying this to be nice. You are an amazing priest. Thank God. Thank you for your vocation. Father Chase has it all. Amazing priest. Some priests, uh, you know, no judgment, but just like, we'll do their own thing up there and whatever. You don't get that in Latin. It's a very strict form. Boom, right? That's number one. Number two, we want unity. Oh, let's have unity and division. Well, let's have it now where all over the world, everyone does their local language. That's unifying. No, it's not. It's but, more like the Tower of Babel. Of course it is. Yeah. If, if, when when, when I'm, I go to the Mass in the Philippines, I don't speak Tagalog. I have no clue what's going on. I mean, except I, of course, can follow the, the Mass. Back then, me and the Filipino guy could perfectly follow along in Latin. It's one language, right? So cool. It was so unified. Well, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about the Mass. No, of course. Mm -hmm. But still, well, I mean, I don't know your experience, but mine was you go to church, you listen to Latin mass, and nobody translates anything. It's sure. Just like, he's just up there saying Latin, and it's nothing, did, and I love it, but. Did you have, did you have a, a missile to fall along with, or no? You know, no, I did not. But then in high school, I, I, you know, I took Latin, maybe three years of Latin, so I kind of knew what they were saying. So right, and you, you learn a lot and you think it's blah, 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 but it's not like you're following a lot. But I, but I would say, no, and, 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 and thank, no, first of all, this is awesome. I love this. Thank you for having a different view. And like, this is great. That, that, that is what some people say. I mean, I love Latin Mass too. Right. But, but what I'd say, what I say back, I don't, I don't care if I'm involved. Like, it's not about me. I think what's been, a, what's been kind of an abusive thing is like, it's too much about the lady now. The Mass isn't about the lady. It's like when a bus, I'm driving a bus, right? Okay, you're my passengers, right? You want me to drive the bus like this, right? On the road, not like this, right? Right? And like the, the Latin mass, the priest facing God is directing worship towards God. Mass is about the worship of God, period. I love the old school, old women who just did their rosary throughout the whole mass and then go to confession during mass. They're, they're actively participating by, by assisting with the priest in the sacrifice and then being in a state of grace. Maybe thank God because he's went to confession now and they get to receive the Eucharist. The mass is not about me. Like I, tonight I'm giving a hippo lecture. That's about me. It's all about me. I wrote it. You know, this class is about us. The, why does everything have to be about us? Right. And I'm not saying that in, you know, attacking you or, or that position. I'm just saying like, why does the, why do I have to know what's going on in the mass? The mass is about the worship of God. Do I have to know where the bus drive? I get on the bus. I should know where he's going. I'm trying to go to Albuquerque. Like in the mass, I'm trying to worship God. Do I have to be up there and explain everything to me? Turn around, make jokes, whatever? No, just drive the bus, dude, right? I don't know. What do you all think?
Right, Alexander, he's he wrote Traditiones Custodes. He convinced Pope Francis to ban one. What do you what do you think? Well, I think that some of this, I think some of this kind of came in, I think, the older generation did grow up with it, is that a lot of the Latin mass that I've been experienced to as a young man, and I do prefer it to the ministry, I prefer it greatly. I think it's a necessary part of Catholic heritage. Is that in reaction to the loss of it, people who celebrated it care about it more. So I think a lot of the, not to denigrate the priests, but the priests are more concerned about pastoral needs and things like that. If they just shifted, they were thinking, okay, I'm going to care for my for the people who are under me, and I'm going to celebrate the liturgy of the church, and then they shit, and they kind of did that very routinely with the Latin mass, and they still kind of did it with the Novus Ordo as it was shipped over. But then the, the priests who go out of their way to celebrate the Latin mass always do that with intentionality. And even if it's a quick low mass, they're still doing it with more intentionality now than perhaps they did in pre-1960s, 1969-1970. I think that's kind of the situation. Is that I, I, any priest who's going to try to do that, especially in the sort of political circumstances now, is passionate about it. So there's a filter before you even get there. Versus any priest who could be saying it was the standard liturgy, you know, that's going to run the whole gamut. I just think quality of priests. Yeah, and I just think like, and, and by the way, I want to be done at 920 today. So I'll get right back on topic. This has been awesome though. This has been great. Like it's class about logic. We talked about the Reformation today, why I believe it's illogical. We're very much on topic and the discussion's been great. But well, what I'm saying is I'll I'll to make a final point. Thank you for all your, your points. Really sincerely. I love you guys. Um well, I'll just say Ryan explained it so well. I don't care like oh some people in the latin mass community are, are alt-right or whatever i don't care about politics like I, great you know uh, they don't care if they're communists i mean of course you know do. yeah do exactly i was good exactly <laughs> no i know but it, it, that's why that's why i started laughing immediately but what i'm saying is you get my point i don't care what someone's politics are it's not about that i'm I, i'm not let's go back to the middle ages i don't want that i'm not you know women should not speak in public i don't want any of that kind of nonsense you know, in fact, I'm saying like, if I told you some of my personal views, I'm pretty woke in some ways, right? Like, it's not about politics. It's like, I just want the most sacred, beautiful liturgy. That's it for one hour. And maybe it's like, you know, people that are daily mass goers, one hour every single day, at least once a week, just have this beautiful whole, that's what I want. I don't want, I don't want innovation. And it's again, we are very blessed once more, thank God, with great priests and, and a whole diocese of Boise. Really, I've been in a lot of masses in Boise. It's really good overall. Maybe, maybe it is. The political climate of like Idaho is generally kind of conservative and not for like crazy innovations. I don't know. I've been blessed to experience a lot of really good masses and priests in Idaho. But it's like, I don't want the priest to like tell me this cool story and stuff. And like, I've been at pre masses where like the deacon starts citing some like Protestant thinker book. I don't want to hear this nonsense. Like, I don't, I'll, I'll look at Barnes and Noble later. I want you just the mass and, you know, focus on the gospel. And that's it. I want it to be like, 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 Someone was once talking about the priest should like a plumber. He just got being in our class. He comes in and fixes the pipes. Do the mass. That's it. Hey, maybe if you want a sports analogy, be like the umpire. You guys know who the most famous umpire is? No, you don't because he, he's invisible. He just calls the game. I don't want the priest up there being like, I'm Johnny. There's a, did you guys hear recently the, the German priest who was rapping during mass? Anyone see this? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to play the video. I'm dead serious. Mm -hmm. I'm dead serious. This is where this kind of stuff leads. He was rapping in German, put a baseball cap on sideways. I'm dead serious. I'm not even going to say how blasphemous and sacrilegious it is, obviously. I'm just saying it's like, this is where this stuff leads. Like, this is where this stuff leads. Like, I'm I'm hip. I'm cool. Pastoral. You know what's pastoral? Sick, sick, witted, sick. Get excited about the faith. But it's like, this is literally, that's just the extension of the Catholic Youth Conference light show stuff we do. Anyways, do you, do you need to know how I really feel about all this stuff? <laughs> and then next time, next time, you know, next time, speak your mind. You don't. I mean, you would know. Don't get this in a Latin mass because the priest does the mass like a plumber, glorifies God, drives the bus facing God. I just. I, I'm done. Okay. So Reformation, Renaissance era. The Renaissance is a very logical time period. We're focused on logic. Um, Petrarch, Giovanni Mira, even someone like Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, who's not some like, he's not canonized. He's not some like so much known for being a Catholic. Like, <laughs> Now, but speaking of the speaking of dialogue, he go to, he was a brilliant young man, but he was completely barnes. Um, he could, he could was basically like, well, there's truth to be found in literally everything. So we're gonna, I want his one of his projects that he had in mind is to like 
put everything under the same roof. Like all these Eastern cults, everything Christian, everything Islamic, everything pagan, like kind of that was one of his ideas. Maybe that's being a little bit uncharitable, but he was so funny. He, but he maybe you have it there, but he had like at the age of like 26, he came 23. Up like 23. He came up with like 900 pieces yeah. to debate. He said, We're gonna have a great, this great debate, and he just like published it to all he, he is famed for the events of 1486 when 23 years old, he defended 900 theses on religion, natural philosophy, magic, in this famous quote, oration on the dignity of man. People call this the manifesto of the Renaissance. Yeah. Well, I mean, he also is famous too for the saying, man is a little bit below the angels. I mean, he's at least anti-Darwinian. That's what's coming down the road. Like, at least like, you know, the logical truth, even if you went bonkers, like you said, of we're all made in God's image and likeness. Um, I see the Renaissance overall is, is logical. If you look at even like Michelangelo's statue of the David, the proportionality, um, the beautiful works of Leonardo da Vinci, the Pietà, like you have this, um, the, the the Last Supper, the way that you know, the, the windows behind Christ, right? The Holy Trinity, just, just, just the mathematical portion of the Sistine Chapel, the Renaissance writ large. And again, we've actually done a class in the past about architecture and art specifically. I don't have all the time today, but in a general sense, the Renaissance, I would say, is more logical than not. If it's falling off bonkers rays or falling back into paganism at times, it at least is trying to, uh, speaking of art, be mimetic. What does mimesis mean? Please never forget this. What is mimesis in art? It's the imitation of reality. Imitation of reality. All modern art is anti-mimetic. All modern art, bana bananas taped to the wall, you know, MoMA, whatever, bananas taped to wall and imaginary sculptures is really kind of like anti-mimetic. But any, Picasso could do mimesis very well. Barb, he could do your, you could do your photographically, you know, draw you. But he does, you know, the kind of weird whatever, this blue period is actually still kind of like not that crazy, but like when he goes full cubism, it's like that's anti mimesis. I mean, and it, a lot of people see in that postmodernism the kind of seeds of rejection of the natural order, or whatever. The Renaissance is not about the Renaissance is, my, is is mimetic. Great sculptures, great portraits, a lot of religious art. Of course, a lot of it is funneled through kind of like shady means with the Medici family in, in, in Florence, but. Or even the discovery of linear perspective, which is like the thing. So if there's one thing if you can get rid of everything else and keep one thing from the Renaissance, I'd say it's in your perspective. Okay. Yeah. Is basically, that's what makes paintings look real. There is the Renaissance of the first people really really discovering in your perspective because that's like you know all of you I don't know all of you might know in your perspective, but that's when you draw everything in focusing on one point on your painting so you're able to draw lines that appear parallel like there's a vanishing point in real life like i'm looking down the pair of train tracks and they hit at the vanishing point they appear together the, the linear perspective lets you line everything up in the painting so that it has a proper proportion and looks to be in perspective yeah and nobody else did that yeah and we don't do that anymore and no, not to that it's certainly not in terms of like a social currency We'll talk about modern art later in the semester because um, we're going to be getting towards like super anti-mimesis. Last four things for you today of this time period writ large. Um, two great works of literature, The Divine Comedy, which I want to talk about actually earlier, but I forgot. Divine Comedy, Dante Alighieri, early 14th century. So this is even predating, uh, I and mean, this is, you know, 200 years before Martin Luther. But The Divine Comedy has been widely called, you know, the summa in verse. It's like taking Aquinas' logical principles if you're like, I had six classes of Aquinas, that was a lot of good logic for me, but I want to read it in artistic form, read this epic poem. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, Dante, um, he goes through uh, hell, purgatory, and heaven. Beatrice, this guide, right? Based on a real person in his life. Dante's Divine Comedy is the first self-help book in human history. You go to Marshall's now and you get, and I'm serious, I'm dead, being dead serious. You go to Marshall's, I'm glad, I appreciate the laughs always, but like I'm being completely serious. It is the first self-help book you know, Dale Carnegie, How to Make Friends, Win Influence, whatever it's called, Eat, Pray, Love, all these kind of books that like tell you what to, uh, Divine Comedy begins, him at middle life stuck in a wood. It's the Robert Frost poem. Robert Frost copies Dante later. You know, two verse, two roads to version of wood. I took the one less traveled that made all the difference. That's Dante um, in a sense. And Divine Comedy is ultimately logical, not just because it's Aquinian and super hyper crazy cycle bonkers Catholic all the way through in the best way. Not crazy bonkers Mirandola style, crazy bonkers good style. Ryan Alexander craziness. And it's like, it's a Catholic the entire time. 
And the end of it is very, very much John's gospel. God is love. Love is the motive power by which everything is bound, glued, stuck together. Love binds all things together. Divine comedy, ultimate. Talked about a lot of illogical stuff today with Protestantism, and I went on a huge polemical rant, which is already going viral online. How if this video is not even posted, it's already going viral. Um, uh, now Dante's bring back some logic. Thomas More, Utopia, early 15th century. Thomas More actually writes Utopia the same year Luther nails his theses. Uh, Utopia is great. I, people still try to make heads and tails out of utopia. Is it a joke? Is he serious? You know, people live on this island and they don't lock their doors and they have tons of cash. They pay these bad guys to go fight their, like these orcs to fight their wars for them and stuff. And, you know, utopia, obviously everyone knows means no place. Like this is not real. Right. But Thomas More got a statue built of him in the Soviet Union. So they're like, look, he's a, he's a proto-communist. And he'd be like, no, that's, you know, it's, 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 it's an, and he, Thomas More in that book writes it in no place. So he actually criticized British politics at that time. Like, what? oh, you know, hold up. That's not what I meant. Utopia is a very, very good book. Very logical book in some of the comments he makes about human nature. I would argue I am an idiot, number one. So take that with a grain of salt. But I would argue I'm not a literary critic. Utopia is ultimately a very logical book criticizing the limits of human nature. You can't have a society like this because people, original sin is real. Last two guys. Oh, man. Pascal and Descartes. Pascal, Blaise Pascal, very famous French mathematician, his wager. What do you think of his wager? I'm going to just, again, we're talking about logic. Let's talk about logic. Pascal's wager, put it in the most vulgar sense, the most kind of basic cliff note sense is, well, again, he's kind of being kicker guardian here, leap of faith, uh, God's existence or not. Let's say you're unsure. Pascal's wager is it's, it's better to believe in God than disbelieve. Because if you believe in God and God exists, you'll go to heaven. If you believe in God, he doesn't exist, you don't lose anything. You still live the good life. If you don't believe in God and he exists, ultimate punishment, you go to hell. Um, and if he doesn't exist, it's not you got a scot free, you still live the garbage life. Because Rhino is Andrew slash Boethius, you know, sin is its own punishment. You know, being bad isn't liberty, it's bad. Is Pascal's wager is logical. What do you think? Yes or no? Is that a good thing? This often pops up in Protestant versus atheist debates. What do you think? Yes? Yeah. Sounds it's pretty good, right? I mean, sure. Uh, we're just talking about basic logic. We're talking about Teddy, our boy, blue collar, popped, plumber logic. It sounds pretty good. Uh, yeah, why not? This is probably back to perfect contrition. Okay. I mean, it's it's a step in the right direction. This is imperfect contrition, Pascal's wager. Yeah, it's very good, very very good. Yeah, so great. covering your bets, hedging your bets. Yeah, I don't know. Exactly. You guys are brilliant. Thank you. It's perfect. Exactly. It's not where you want to be. It's not on fire faith. It's basically saying, I don't know, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna bet on God. But it's like I'm actually kind of being a scumbag, lack of faith. I don't really maybe believe at all. I just I don't want to go to hell, right? I'm doing this just in case God is real, I don't go to hell. I said, but it's, that's better than being like, let's be a scumbag. You know, Ryan Alexander in the group chat was like, let's go to Vegas and do crazy stuff. It was not this, you know, I was just like Ryan. <laughs> but, yes, go ahead. Pascal's one says it's very good. Why? There's just a lot of interesting little tidbits in there. I like Cleopatra's nose. Uh, so hmm. Explain this to us. I'm going to put you on camera. Um, if Cleopatra's nose had been different, then we would not be standing here today. Why? So, like butterfly effect stuff? Yes. Okay, why? What's up? Because that? Mark, if Cleopatra had an ugly nose, then Mark Antony would not have fallen for Cleopatra. And if Mark Antony had not fallen for Cleopatra, then we he would not have been, there would not have been a civil war against Octavius Caesar, and it would not have been a civil war against no Roman Caesar. Empire. The Roman Empire would not have gained power over Palestine in the same way, and then he couldn't have called a census for oh. Bethlehem and all these other things. Of course, everything downstream. That's you know, cool. How the world played out, they would have no to different. So Pascal uses that as a kind of slight argument towards God's providence, as you say, like, well, now, there are too many variables for us to just to even think. About. How is it that for this to work? Yeah, that one atheist guy who became a believer, maybe kind of variation off this, said that God doesn't exist. The odds of that, with all these coincidences lining up perfectly, it would be like a tornado going through a trailer park, and at the back end, the 747 is perfectly assembled, right? It's just like it's too improbable. It's either completely crazy and what luck, or God exists. And what's more rational? 
What's more logical? Logic class. God exists, most likely, right? Some person would say it that way. If there's all these coincidences. If, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And here, this, I'm saying that as a statement of faith. If it's too good to be true, that for there to be no God and this nature keeps, ah, she's winning the jackpot every day. Probably not that. There probably isn't an intellectual divine force behind it all. Descartes. Descartes, anti-Aquinas, even unintentionally. Descartes, when he does his cogito ergo sum, he goes to, on a pilgrimage to the shrine at Loreto to thank Our Lady. He's not trying to be an anti-Catholic guy. Descartes creates the matrix. Descartes creates, I'm only real, everyone else is a figment of my imagination, AI, whatever. Descartes in 1639, born years after Aquinas. Remember, when Aquinas said, Aquinas didn't actually say this, but this was his philosophy. Remember, Aquinas' his philosophy is, I am, therefore I think. God is, therefore I am. Exodus 3.14, I am who am, because I am who am, God is, I am. Being, philosophy of being, therefore I love, I fight, whatever, Descartes turns it on his head. I don't know about all that, about being and me being and God. I just know I think. I just know I have a reality spinning in my head. Maybe it's the matrix. Maybe you're all figments of my imagination. I don't know. Maybe God is not the ontological starting point. I am. And again, he's saying this as a Catholic. He went to on a pilgrimage. He wasn't a snowball effect. And from that, you can say Descartes is kind of the father. People have called Descartes the father of continental philosophy. You call him the father of modern, modern skepticism and atheism in some ways. Dave Schmidt, if reality is all in your head, well, then I guess you're in charge. And you could just not do other stuff, right? What's up with these obligations to go to church and whatever? It's you're in charge, right? We're all robots or whatever. That is, again, very vulgar. And it's like, it's, that, that is not a, that is a very, the vulgar is the wrong word. Like rough around the edges explanation, but that's basically what it comes down to, is that Aquinas, ultimate logic, I would argue, as a chauvinist Catholic, bringing it full back to my Protestant polemical earlier, Aquinas um, is all about the philosophy of being. I am, therefore I do all this other stuff, where Descartes says, no, all I know is that I'm thinking stuff. All I know is that there's chemicals firing in my brain, but everything else might be fake, right? Might be just a movie, a dream. With that, Father Ben, would you be so kind? So good to see you again in class. Could you close us out with a prayer? And God bless you all. You know what I'm going to say? God bless the Protestants especially. That's what I'm going to say to close out. Any Protestants watch at the end? I love you guys. Just kidding. I'm just kidding about that. I don't know. Let's just have Father Ben lay this out. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, I Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of Christ alone. We thank you to bring us salvation. We thank you for today's lecture. Bless our teacher, Dr. Gershon. Bless each and every one of us. Bless the faith we have in God that it may bring us salvation through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. The mighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen.